How do our most senior leaders feel about the direction and trajectory of our industry? What's their outlook on the future state of wholesaling? And based on their considerable experiences, what lessons would they help us all learn? That's what we want to find out in this special series of episodes we're calling Lessons from Leaders. Welcome to the only podcast on the planet dedicated to exploring the art, science, and lifestyle of wholesalers and their leaders. This is the new Wholesaler Masterminds radio show. I'm your host, the founder of Wholesaler Masterminds, Rob Shore. This episode of Lessons from Leaders is sponsored by the Money Management Institute and their Center for Distribution Excellence. MMI is the industry association that connects all participants, including asset managers, platform sponsors, and technology providers in the always changing and rapidly growing advisory solutions world. The new Center for Distribution Excellence, built by and for financial industry sales professionals, is dedicated to discovering, promoting, and improving best practices in the wholesaling community. In Industry First, the center brings together a comprehensive suite of events, networking opportunities, and educational resources, all designed to help sales professionals interact with their counterparts from across the industry and learn from the best of the best. For more information about the Center for Distribution Excellence, call MMI at 646-868-8500. That's 646-868-8500. Or visit mminst.org. Wholesalers, welcome back to the new Wholesaler Masterminds radio show. This is our series, Lessons from Leaders. And you, you recall back uh, number show number two that we did, we, we had that podcast that we did with Cerule. Uh, the pretext of the show was, you know, we, we don't always have the leaders on the line. Oftentimes, we have those influencers of the leader's thought process. So who's going into C-suites and saying what about what the future of wholesaling looks like? So as the story would go, I was doing some random surfing just last week, and I came across a white paper uh, that was originally printed through Advisor Perspectives, and the title of it is a little ominous. The title of it is The Death of a Wholesaler, How to Avoid Irrelevance. Will rising technology indexing and fee compression kill the wholesaler? What is the future of asset management sales? Well... I'm sure that's got your ears perked up and it had my eyes bulging out of my head. So I need to know more about the paper. I downloaded, I read it and said, these gentlemen would probably make good guests for our podcast. The gentlemen today are David Ristow, Director of Business Development for Hidden Levers. He's a serial entrepreneur as Hidden Levers is his third startup that he's worked on in the financial technology space. Past ventures included an options SMA and research company an automated back office tools for RIA venture, and now a risk and big data analytics company for financial professionals. David's current main focus at Hidden Levers is building an asset management platform to help asset managers add digital tools and automation to their offering. Joining him on the podcast also today is Jeff Baker, also business development for Hidden Levers. Jeff leverages his prior experience as an investment analyst to support product development as well as developing new business relationships. Prior to working at Hidden Levers, Jeff held investment analyst positions with UBS and Raymond James. Gentlemen, welcome to the new Wholesaler Masterminds radio show. Hello. Thanks, Ralph. Thanks for having us. This is David. Absolutely. Glad glad you could be here, Jeff. Welcome, welcome. Thank you very much, Rob. We're excited to be here. So let's uh, let's let's roll right in. How did you guys, either one of you, you decide who's going to answer the question? How did you guys get to this place? How did you get to this paper? What what, what from from your positioning, you know, what what was the motivation to produce the paper? Where was the research born out of, et cetera? Please. Yeah, sure. I'll take that. Um, we started out looking at this kind of concept. Our company does big data analytics, basically re- researching how world events are going to impact uh, investments. And what we found over time was that uh, there was a lot of opportunity for us to um, 
develop products that would help financial advisors to research and investigate their investments and be able to look at how they compare to other investments. And that's sort of the, the thought process of, you know, you know if, if we can take technology and we can build it in such a way that it really helps the financial advisor to look at products and compare them uh, and look at their whole portfolio allocation in a way that they can really identify problems or issues or strengths or weaknesses uh, of different investments inside their portfolio. Well, then what role does necessarily active management or the wholesaler have in that space? Um, and I thought to say, you know, as you said from the beginning, the, the title is very ominous, right? But that's really just, you know, attention grabbing, right? Uh, we don't necessarily believe that, you know, this is a completely irrelevant position by any means or anything like that. It's really more to think about how will the position shape over the next few years. And if we're in a space where we have fee compression, we have the rise of technology, as I was just kind of mentioning, and that's where we really come at this from, which is this technology perspective. And we also have, um, you know, indexing as well becoming very popular. What value can a, whole, can a wholesaler add to that conversation? Now, w- w- so, let, me, let me just ask yeah, you a question that goes back to, to what I was wanting to nibble on a little bit. And that is, did you guys come upon your, and I don't disagree with anything in the paper, but I'm just curious how you got yeah. here. Did, did you get to your conclusions doing direct interviews with national sales managers? Did you get to your conclusions by talking to wholesalers? Mm-hmm. Did you get to your, sure. so what was the source data that got you to this place? Yeah, I'll speak a little bit to that. Um, and, and, you know, we actually work with asset management firms. So uh, we have a number of asset management firms that use our product. Uh, so that's one of our, our direct sources of information was uh, talking with those firms, learning about their process, learning about the issues that they're having in, in the world around them. Uh, we do compete with some asset management technology that also exists out there. So we're very familiar with that, that landscape. And then we also just did some hard research, you know, looking at other white papers, looking at other uh, research that had been done, culling some of that together uh, uh, to do that. So I would say it was mostly through conversation with directly with asset management firms uh, that we've either done direct business with or have uh, been prospective clients of ours. And then also, um, you know, going out and actually reading re- materials and research and finding that information in that way. Very helpful. Thank you. So yes. I, I want to share with the audience uh, something that is a quote from the paper. Uh, it's just a, a paragraph and a half, if you will. It says, the death of traditional wholesaling is inevitable. How it's reborn is what we're interested in discussing. And I just want to add a commentary for our listeners about that. If you've been listening to anything in this Lessons from Leadership series, you know, and I'm sure would likely agree that the next five to 10 years of wholesaling will take a different shape. It will require a different kind of mindset and attitude and skill set in order to be successful. So that is irrefutable in, in my opinion, and I hope yours. Wholesalers will be reborn as tech-enabled financial product experts who create efficiency by leveraging omni-channel technical, uh, technology solutions. It's putting down the golf clubs and picking up a tablet. It's throwing away business cards for digital portals that collect information in unique and interesting ways. It's combining tech skills with people skills to be able to enhance wholesaler performance. So let me, let me ask you a hard question that maybe you feel comfortable biting off. And if you don't, please tell me, how are we going to start to bridge the gap of bringing wholesalers up the technology utilization spectrum? How are we, so this, 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 if we're going to talk about the wholesaler of the future and the wholesaler of the future, as your paper suggests, and I agree with, needs to be far more technologically proficient. How do we get them up the ladders. And, and, and in order to uh, move that thought forward, I'll, I'll share with you an interaction of a discussion I had just last week. I was talking to a national sales manager and I said, well, how technologically proficient are your folks? And, and there was a, a bit of a, a bit of a, a giggle, if you will. And, and he kind of said, well, you know, most of the guys knew how to do email. And I just kind of stopped right there. I was like, okay, if, if that is, if that is the, the velocity of technology knowledge that you have resident in your organization, then there's some work to do, right? So how do we get folks more technology enabled? How do we how do we get them up the ladder? As I said, for either one of you guys. Yeah, and I'll, I'll answer that. Rob. Yeah, please. Um, I mean, I think I think that's a that's a great question, but I think the it's incumbent upon the technology providers to make whatever platform or system they're providing to the wholesaler really easy to use. 
And I think, you know, there's a lot of legacy technology out of there out there we can think of, you know, like a Bloomberg terminal, right? Which is really useful for a lot of people, but it's not something that the layperson can jump in and, and use really quickly. Um, if you want to enable technology for your wholesalers, don't worry about making sure that your wholesalers are, are uh, you know, that they're tech geniuses. Make sure that the technology that you're adopting for them is as easy to use as opening up Outlook and sending an email. Mm. You know, if if my grandma can can jump on a on a cell phone, she's 80 years old and use an iPhone. And there's no reason why a wholesaler can't use a system like, say, a Hidden Levers or any other platform out there and generate useful insights for their advisors or the institutions they're working with. No, that I mean that's 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 a great answer. Uh, and there's all, but there's also a behavioral component. I mean, one of the things that you talk about, and and why don't you why don't you set the stage? Why don't you set the stage for what happens at a conference, right? Because it was it was a it was a great um, uh, scenario, real world scenario, about you know what happens at a at a you know Raymond James National Sales Meeting today, and what happens at a Raymond James National Sales Meeting, LPL National Sales Meeting, Commonwealth, Merrill, fill in your favorite broker dealer. What happens on that conference floor? at the trade booth. So t- tell me, tell me what today looks like and tell me what tomorrow looks like as, as you <laughs> suggest it should, it should look. Yeah. And I, I mean, these are obviously gross generalizations. So, well, they weren't far we're off not. from the truth. That's for darn sure. <laughs> we were, you know, and, and Jeff and I uh, have gone to many trade shows uh, and see, you know, see what that's like. And I think for us, the conversation is often today, more around how do I get this person to talk to me and engage in conversation that is, you know, things that we have in common, whether it be, you know, I think we use the reference of golf, you know, many times and throughout the paper uh, or sport or uh, just bring somebody in and you have, you know, a, a great looking guy in, in a great suit, uh, a gray suit or a dark blue suit and, you know, the fancy shoes and, and the, the, the gelled hair and and that's sort of the common look that we see and that is the the wholesaler of today it's it's not as much a person that i can turn to and say okay well really help me provide value in this relationship where i'm getting something from you and i'm not saying this is again a, a, good, a gross generalization but the, the person of the future is someone who when that person steps up immediately has maybe a tablet in hand and can immediately provide value to that conversation, whether it be, okay, well, let's talk about a few of the positions that you hold in your model today. Now, one of the rubs against that that we've heard from you know, wholesalers out in the industry or, or asset managers that we work with is how quickly does a, a you know a, a, an advisor or, or a, a rep of a broker-dealer feel comfortable kind of giving that information? Mm-hmm. So I think one of the things that is interesting as we think about more of that behavioral, as you're talking about, is – we have to push that sort of forward. You know, if, if, if we're going to talk about, for me, the asset management space has to start to think about how do they position themselves as, as the way they look from the outside, you know, take a company like a a BlackRock, for example, and some of the work they're doing in this space uh, to create technology. And that's really, you know, as you look at them from the outside, they're starting to become more and more uh, sort of, as you think about them generally, a tech company, right? And wait, wait, if you look it, at another, it, yeah, go ahead. You no, know, I'm, I'm agreeing with what you're saying. It, it's interesting, yeah. though. It in in this in this hypothetical, not very hypothetical situation right. that you speak of this 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 conference display floor. I, I agree with the asset manager or the wholesale. It says, look, I, I can't exactly whip out my iPad and approach someone that's come up to pick up a koozie cup and say, so tell me about one of your holdings. But if the whole experience was re-engineered, and this is what Correct. I think you're saying, is if the whole experience was re-engineered, and if if the booth and all of its trappings showed up as a uh, technolo- technologically engaging destination to then have a conversation around, that's a very different scenario. That's correct, yeah, and that's exactly how we, we look at it. In the beginning of the paper, we actually write sort of this kind of... Um, 
I don't know what the right word is, sort of futuristic, you know, kind of look into the future, this yeah. sort of quick fictional story and a sketch of the future. And you find out at the end that a lot of the stuff is actually being done more from an automated standpoint. It's more robotically done. Uh, and the the reason we think that that's really compelling or, or really what is the future is because of other other factors that we talk about in the paper, like fee compression or indexing or the rise of just technology, the automation. You think about what happened to a sales, you know, excuse me, a travel agent, you know, over time, you know, they sort of had that specialty in being able to help you define, you know, book the hotels and, and all the things that you had to do for uh, a vacation that was a laborious process back in the day. Well, you know, Companies like Priceline, Hotels.com, et cetera, we can think of all these, what, these, you know, these, uh, these commercials we see every single day, they've completely automated that entire process. And so it was a process that happened over time. But when you think about booking travel today, you do not think about using a travel agent. You think about going on your website, going on a website and booking through Priceline. You, and that's, that's the experience. So to your point exactly, it is a re-engineer process that will need to happen. Um, and the firms that do it the best, the most quickly, I, we think will have the most fruit of their labor. Um, and the companies that don't and continue down a traditional route will continue to struggle because, let's face it, people are becoming more and more adept at doing more and more sensitive things through digital platforms. Um, and that's that's what the future holds. Yeah. It's very hard, very hard for us to imagine that going backwards, not continuing to entrench itself even more forward. One of the things you mentioned, and I can't recall if you wrote it this way in the paper, and it, and if you did, forgive me, but it, it's this notion of no. If I just want to take a round trip flight from San Francisco to JFK, I don't need a travel agent. But if I want to take barge cruises through the northern Mediterranean and and pick, you know, the finest destinations. I need somebody to help me guide, to guide me through that. I, I would spend far too much time online uh, and maybe not have the best outcome. And so I'm, I'm hearing you say something similar, which is, you know, there's so much do it yourself in the marketplace around uh, advisor access to information. But if I really want a educated professional to help guide my hand in that portfolio construction, as an example, I do need them and their techno- technology solutions. Is that what I hear you saying? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll speak for both of us. I think you, you summed it up quite well. You know, going in and buying a plane ticket to, to New York um, from California, it's kind of like when your wholesaler comes up and they just want to sell you a, a small cap mutual fund. Mm. That's how the business operates today. Here's my strategy. Here's how it compares to its peers. And here's how we can incorporate it in your models that you use with your clients. You know, we think taking a more holistic approach and talking about, you know, just like you mentioned, the entire vacation, the the whole enchilada, the entire portfolio, that's where wholesalers are going to become really useful for advisors. If they're tech enabled, then when you go to approach that booth, it's not just to grab a koozie and then hear someone's quick pitch on their latest real estate product. No, it's to say, okay, let's have a serious conversation about your models that you're using. Let's analyze them and Maybe that wholesaler doesn't even need to sell anything, but let's just see where there are some holes. Let's talk about some areas where you're unhappy with that current allocation. Yeah. A lot different from, you know, buying stakes and, and uh, you know, taking someone to a golf outing. That's product focused. It's intelligent. It's pointed, um, but it's complex. And we know that there is a role for wholesalers in that environment. Why? Because advisors spend thousands and thousands of dollars every year on technology to help them manage portfolios. Why not include the wholesaler in that conversation? You know, it's interesting. One of the things you talk about in the paper is geeks with people skills, which, which let me say that one more time for anybody who's having shivers go up their spine, geeks with people skills, (laughs) which is a bit of a disconnect for uh, wholesalers, especially of a certain age. Uh, So they are not necessarily geeks of any kind. Uh, They definitely have the people skills wired if you're talking about this thing called the cyborg wholesaler, you, you, you talk about these four main takeaways that you see of the wholesaler of the future. So let's, as we kind of round out our conversation for today, let's talk about these four main takeaways. Um, number one is, is to gain trust by offering something of value. What do you got? Embellish that for us. Yeah, sure. I, I can. So I think for, and, and geeks with, with people skills, again, you know, it, it's, uh, <laughs> It's a funny way to think things. I mean, Jeff and I are, are definitely feel like we're kind of in that in that vein. So, um, 
I think the thing for us is when we are pitching uh, our product, which is a stress testing product and a, a product that can help you understand the risk that you have inside your allocation, um, it's very easy, I think, for us to gain trust with, with advisors very quickly because right off the bat, when we come into our product, we're able to talk to them about something that's of value to them. How much risk is in your current allocation today? Well, that's something if you talk to every advisor and you talk about how much risk do they think should be in an allocation, uh, you're going to get two responses we found. One is, I know exactly how much risk is in my allocation today, which is actually a good response. We, we like that response because when we stress test their portfolio, we can put that to the test. And the second thing is, I don't know. I have no idea how much risk is in my allocation today. I think it's probably roughly around this amount of potential downside, this amount of potential upside, but I'm not really sure. And so by providing them something, a nugget of value, I've just, I haven't even done anything. I haven't pitched them any product. I haven't pitched them any kind of solution. I've just gained some trust because I provided them something that I know, right, on this side of the table that they don't know today. And I can't stress enough that I think that this is the most important thing that you should be demonstrating in that relationship, which is trust. So before you even go out and say, hey, here's this great alternative long short fund or this whatever managed futures fund or small cap fund, whatever it is that we want to pitch, and this is true in all sales, um, we need to demonstrate some trust with that advisor. So for us, it's how do we gain that? Well, we think using technology is a great way to do that because we can, the two of us together can look at something like an allocation and very quickly get something out of a system like a hidden levers or any other technology that's being built today. And, one, um, and so that's, that's where that comes from. No, and one of the benefits of that, and I'm, and I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on the second bullet, but, but the second bullet, not because it's not important, it is critically important. We talk it to death in our business and it's irrefutable that taking this approach does this. And that is you are a consultant rather than a salesperson. And, and, and when you are partnering with an advisor in the true spirit of that word partner, you are being a consultant to them. And if you have this, this robust competency uh, that is technologically enabled, you show up as a consultant versus a pusher of product. Uh, and, and that leads to your next point, which is to offer product suggestions only when it makes a difference. Embellish that for me, please. Yeah, maybe I can, I can answer that. Um, so absolutely, you know, once you've gained that advisor's trust and you've provided them with some insights into the current allocation, um, you know, what you can do is identify where the trouble spots of that allocation happen to be, and then you can build something that's going to address those particular issues. Like David mentioned, we work with some asset managers today, and you know, it's, it's not particularly difficult. There are times where we'll go through cases with them that they have with an advisor, and there are going to be certain instances where building a, a new recommendation is maybe not going to materially change the allocation. Um, maybe the stress test results are similar. Maybe the overall composition of the portfolio is similar. Maybe the past performance is similar. And if that's the case, then you know it's probably not necessary to build a new recommendation or make changes to that existing portfolio. Mm -hmm. Which and what that particular no, what that particular I... asset manager has done is encouraged their their portfolio consultants to to just say, okay, you know, that's great. You know, call me in six months when something else changes with another model. It, 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 it changes the entire dynamic of the sales discussion because then it's, it's not just, oh, well, that won't fit. Why don't you try this one? And if that doesn't fit, let's try this one. That's not it. it. Now you have positioned yourself, as we said, as the consultant, and in doing so, you have built trust. The last bullet point, and I need the proper definition, maybe some of our listeners do too, uses an omni-channel approach to selling. Gentlemen, what do we mean by omni-channel? <laughs> yeah, I can take that. So omni-channel approach was uh, something that came about in the retail space, actually, in the last decade. And it's the idea that uh, brick-and-mortar stores need an answer to the fact that people don't necessarily get in their car and drive down to Kohl's on the weekend to buy a pair of pants, right? They can just log on to amazon.com and, or they can log on to now Kohl's.com, right? And so the idea of omni-channel was really to create multiple instances of the same experience for people, but also that those instances spoke to each other. So for example, I'm at Kohl's and I need a pair of pants, but they don't have the right size. 
so the person that's working at Kohl's can quickly go on the website and find that right size and have that delivered to your home in 24 or 48 hours, right? And so they don't lose the sale just simply because they're at the store and they don't have the right size and vice versa. You're online and you don't want to wait 48 hours because you got a, you know, a date that night and you need a nice pair of slacks and you want them now or you want them very soon. So you go online, you order them online and you go and pick them up at the store. Mm-hmm. And so these these abilities for these two things to communicate to each other are super important. So inside of this type of environment for us, what we look at is why aren't digital tools communicating more with wholesalers and back and forth? Uh, for example, just uh, as an example, what might work, and this is, you know, throw this out idea out there to any anybody that's listening, you know, using an online portal information on that. But at the same time, in order to access that information, that individual has to give up something, a name, an email address, a phone number. What if that now can communicate with a CRM system that that wholesaler logs into every single day? And because they've got the zip code, they can automatically connect that person that lead with that wholesaler so now that wholesaler now has that that person's a a bit of information about them maybe not everything they need Uh, and so that's what we when we talk about omni channel it's it's using both technology and humans together uh just the same way i described using a website and a and a brick and mortar store well both of those no i follow you on a personal note and and just to 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 bring it home uh, recently i was i was shopping for uh health insurance, right? So the open enrollment is coming around and and I'm an independent solopreneur and I need to find my own health insurance. And I I was actually uh, looking at a a group plan, a small group plan, and I filled out some data online. And I kid you not, within 10 minutes, my phone rang and it didn't ring from the company that was actually the writer of the insurance. It rang from a broker that is deeply connected with the writer of insurance and at one point in the conversation, pretty quickly on, I said, how did you get this lead that fast? And, and they took me through exactly what you just described. They, they were armed and ready to assist me based on what I had put into the website. And they were a authorized representative of the insurance writer to contact prospects. Because number one, the insurance writer didn't want to take on the cost of all the additional people that would be needed. And two, they wanted to be more responsive to inquiries. I think that's what you're saying, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah. I mean, and, and this is just one example, right? That's one, one example of how an omni channel can work together, but it's, it's simply just the idea that, um, instead of, you know, you just go to a conference and you get leads that way and you go home and you put them into a CRM system where they sit until you update that with more information. That's all one way direction, you know, engagement, right? Everything is coming into the wholesaler and going right back out from the wholesaler, right? But there's not multiple points of entry, right? And so I think for omni-channel is the idea of creating multiple points of entry and creating multiple ways, systems that can communicate together. Uh, There's no reason, and technology is definitely disadvanced, where you can take a, a website and that website can link directly to our CRM and a CRM can link directly with another piece of technology that can create a proposal report Um, without ever even touching um, the wholesaler's hands. Because what is the wholesaler's real job in this new world? It's not to input information into a system. It's to take that information and make the sale. Mm -hmm. And so for us, it's all about how do we create that efficiency in that process so that instead of the wholesaler just, you know, inputting information into multiple points or even other individuals at an asset management company, using technology to create that efficiency and so all the wholesaler does is takes whatever that output is and create the experience for the advisor where that advisor says yeah let's do this that sounds like a good idea right that's yeah. the idea of i thought omni channel so wholesalers if you've been listening to the series of lessons from leaders uh I, I i thank you and applaud you if you haven't and this is one of your first experiences i invite you to go back into the podcast archives look at the lessons from leaders lineup and one of the things that you're going to find is the consistency of messaging through all the leaders we've talked to the consultants that we've talked to this whole nest message that you know i hope you know but it just underscores it that what got you to today is not going to get you to tomorrow and there's a whole host of skills that you need to bone up on. And this today is, is another skill set that you should be giving pause for thought to. And if it's not provided by your firm, 
then you just need to figure out how you might be able to MacGyver your solutions until your firm comes along. Because being a trusted consultant, uh, being someone who is a provider of information that doesn't automatically go to product, doing it through a technology solution, whether you find it yourself or your firm finds it for you, those are going to be attractive until perhaps our firms come along and gives, gives us some of the more advanced futuristic viewpoint that David and Jeff have shared today. The white paper was called The Death of a Wholesaler, How to Avoid Irrelevance. We were joined today by David Ristow and Jeff Baker. Gentlemen, thank you for being on the podcast today. Yes, thank you very much for having us, Rob. We appreciate it. Wholesalers, come back next time for the episode of the new Wholesaler Masterminds radio show. For more information about Wholesaler Masterminds, visit us at wholesalermasterminds.com. Find the new Wholesaler Masterminds radio show at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, and Spotify.